Welcome back. We're on part two of money, and we left off with students knowing how to identify money, the value of money, pretty proficient at doing some of the basic trades, five pennies for a nickel. And so we want to go a little bit further than that now. As we start moving into uh, grade two and up, we're really starting to look at using that notion of regrouping, um, the trading that we were doing in the earlier starting points with our money. But it doesn't have to just jump right into uh, a double digit addition or a double and a single digit addition. What we really want students to do is use the money understanding that they had from before. So I'm just gonna take my title away here. On our website, you will find that there are a number of different money placemats that you can use. This is just one sample of one of them. They're already made, so it's just a matter of using and pulling off the one that works for you. But here, what the students are doing is they would get a bag of money, just the random bag, whatever, and I'm mine are so mixed up now, they don't all have the same thing, which is great. And I've given them a map this time that has penny, nickel, quarter, and loony. So what I'm trying to get at is, can they convert for every five pennies, trade them for a nickel, Every time they have five nickels, can they trade them for a quarter? And then for four quarters, can they make a loony? So I'm looking at all the different ones. Now there's a placemat that has the penny, the nickel, the dime, the quarter. Like they're all there. Whatever combination you want has pretty much been done. It's a matter of you deciding what it is you want to focus on. And so really that's what we ask them to do, to give them a bag of money, Ziploc bag, they sort out whatever coins I want them to work with. They throw randomly whatever they have on there. And that means that every student will have a little bit of a different starting point. And that's great because they can also check each other's work to see if, if they're doing it right. Or you can have a person watch and they can see that, that they're counting out that they have one, two, three, four, five. And for those five, I'm going to take them away and I'm going to trade for another nickel and so on. So it just gives them that opportunity to reiterate what they've already learned um, just in starting with their coins. Constantly doing this because... The idea is not only for them to know the money, but notice that we're we're already doing the math. That's what we want is we want them to to show us that I can convert. And that same idea that I would have just thrown base 10 blocks at them and say for every 10 units, I want you to make a rod. Let's make this real. This is about what I could walk around with in my pocket on a day by day basis. OK, so we would then do a lot of this practice and I would never forgo this at some point you're going to say well they know how to make those trades yep it doesn't hurt though at any time to bring out um, any kind of different ones um, different versions of it just so that they start to see them I'm going to show you just yet another one which is going to be kind of our goal so notice that this one's already stepped it up and we're going to we're going to backtrack in just a moment but when I say there's different placemats already been created so here I see the penny, the dime, the dollar, $10, $100, and we gave them $1,000, although it's not in circulation, just like the penny, we gave it to them because that really benefits us in the mass. So pulled up an old one that has the queen on it, showed them what it looked like. So we have printed those off so students can use those in their money kits. But notice this one's quite specific. This one has coins and bills that are feeding into dollars and cents. Now, I would initially just do this. Again, empty your bag. And we have two kinds of bags of money. One is the general bag. It has everything in it. A little bit of every bill. Every coin is in there. Of different amounts are in there. So they would only pick out the ones that they need here and put them on. Everything else would just stay in the bag. We also have a second set of, of uh, bank or money uh, pouches that we use with the students. And those are base 10 uh, pouches. And those base 10s only contain what you see here. And why do I do that? Because eventually, and we're already in grade two, I want to step it up so that I start to get to that powers of 10, the trading for the values of 10, the base 10 blocks that I would have normally given you that are just plastic and yellow or pink or blue are now the money. So this is where the base 10 conversation is hitting, hitting the students, but it's 
doing it with the real things as opposed to an abstract. Once I've got this mastered, it's easy for me to bring out the base 10 blocks, and I still would. And when you do, once the students have done lots of work with this, and this becomes their mini calculator, then really what you'll see is when you bring out the base 10 blocks, as soon as you put the unit down, they'll say, that's a loony. You don't tell them that. They'll tell you that. They'll say, that's a loony. This rod is a $10 bill. They ignore the decimals altogether because they've already made the, they've already made the connection that that flat is their $100 and that cube is their $1,000 bill. So that's where I say the money should come before the base 10 blocks just because it gives them a real context. Then I can go abstract and use it in another way as well. Okay, so to trade this, we, we would do some work with this. And I wouldn't even say dollars and cents. I would just say today, these are the only things that we're going to play with. So every time I need, how many do I need here to get one of these? And what are these called? And I would just review it with them. And it should be second nature, penny and a dime. How many of these do you need? How many pennies do you need to get this dime? Well, I need 10. For every 10 here, I can trade for a new one here. Okay, well then how many dimes do I need to get into here? And so on. I'm not, I don't care that there's a decimal in here. I, that's not the whole point behind this. The point is to get me to understand how these tens are working together. And right now, all I want you to know is, can you make the trades and convert to the next one up at an appropriate part? So lots and lots and lots of practice doing this. And the faster they can do it, the better they can. And the base 10 uh, kits also have varied amounts in them. So when they pile on their pennies and they pile on their dimes, they find out that they've all got different amounts in there. And so again, they're making their trades. And what they do always like to do is count exactly how much money they have. That is the one thing that money does is it really gets them good at adding mentally because they want to know who has more money in their pouch than somebody else does. So this is another placemat that you can pull off of the website and use that to start with. So where we're gonna go then, is we're going to move to the strip that we've used a lot with, with our students. And this one has the words dollars and cents on it, but again, I can ignore that if I wanted to. Um, I don't put a decimal in here, notice there's no decimal, and there won't be a decimal even until after they tell me how I would get one tenth of a dollar. So all of that decimal business has, it's easy, it's an easy flow in later in grade four. They don't need to know that that's what this dark line represents. All they know is that this dark line separates cents from dollars. And what our goal is, is to get them to understand is what is the difference between cents and dollars? So to that end, one of the things that we do a lot of work with, first of all, is just to show students what does a hundred cents look like. So with one of the money apps that I've shown you, I just pulled off and created 100 pennies. Now today, I don't have this in a plastic pouch, so it doesn't have a glare on it for the recording, but I just put these into plastic pouches so the students can take dry erase markers and do whatever it is I'm gonna ask them to do with their 100 cents. But they need to understand what 100 cents really means. And they need to understand how this all plays out as far as the money is concerned. And again, I'm gonna leverage this not just for the money, I'm gonna also do a lot of other things with this, but let's just start off with this. So first of all, we get them to look at how many are in each line. And sort of what do I see between here and here? Well, I see five cents. Oh, five cents and five cents is 10 cents. I could see that I have two nickels sitting side by side. So that first row could really be two nickels, or it could also be the equivalent of one dime. So every row could be laid out and we have them do that. I could lay out two nickels that represent the first five cents and the second five cents, or the whole row represents one dime. So if I go through and I do that each time, they start to see that the next question logically would be, how many, how many nickels are there in 100 cents? Again, we're trying to get them to realize that they have 20. They could skip count by fives. 
they can double check that. If they skip count by fives 20 times, will they get to 100? They can double check that. And the answer is yes. What about dimes? How many dimes do I have? How many times do I skip count by 10 to get to 100? So it's that continuous back and forth. This isn't just name the coin and move on. So I'm using my coins. I'm seeing that I have this. And then I might ask them, when you have all of these pennies, what is the one thing you could trade it for? So then they learn that this whole thing could be just one loony. And that's a good time to reiterate that conversation again about, wow, can you imagine walking around with all of these in your pocket instead of just this one coin? And that's always got a, whoa, that's a lot. Like that'd be, and I'd say, yeah, it is a lot. And that was one of the reasons that they, they dropped it is people were just saying they, they were worth so little and they just bulked up their pockets or their, their purses or their wallets. And so not to mention that it cost them more to, to create them. So these are the pieces that we want them to start making connections to, right? So every time I get to 100 pennies, every time I get to 20 nickels, every time I get to 10 dimes, I have a loony. So they're starting to get a sense of what 100 looks like. And so when we ask them, what is the difference between cents and a dollar? They, they eventually will say to you, well, cents are all those coins that you're going to get together and eventually make a dollar. So they recognize that once they get to a hundred of whatever combination, that goes away, the cents go away and we go into dollars. And that's the connection we want them to start with. That's a really, really important connection. Now I wanna show you something else that you see here that maybe isn't obvious right now, but just to, to start you off, Again, I have a row here that could be two nickels or it could be one dime. So what you're also creating here, maybe I'll use a darker one. This should be okay. And right on my mat here, that I am creating a unit fraction. I am recognizing that when I have 10 dimes sitting here, each one of those dimes is one out of 10 possible dimes that will go into my loony. This is a unit fraction. And remember we said right up front that money would be used for fractions. They need to see that. They need to put it on a number line. They need to see money on a number line. So they need to recognize that for every dime that I put down, I have one tenth or one out of 10 possible dimes that are going to make after 10 of them that make a loony. And that means that since I have 20 nickels, each one of these nickels is also a unit fraction of 1 20th. Every time I skip count by five, I'm skip counting by 1 20th of a fraction. So this is already jumping into fractions. Where do they do unit fractions? They actually start them in grade one. They don't talk about fractions in the sense of unit fractions, but they talk about what is a half, the word half. They do the half. They visualize the half. There is absolutely nothing that says you have to show me one over two. It's all done with pictures. But by the time I get to grade two, I'm very much into one half, one third, one quarter, up to one tenth. So they're showing them unit fractions. And it's not about showing me a circle and coloring in one shade of that circle and saying, I counted the pieces and it's one out of seven. That's not really understanding what a unit fraction is. We wanna put it in a context. So again, we want them to be able to see how do those unit fractions relate to something. Money is a great one to do that in. So this is one way that I can do this. So we're gonna get into adding and subtracting here right away. We're gonna bring this back out again when we wanna talk about multiplication skills. So we'll leave that one for now and then we'll come back. So we're gonna regroup my mat here. I'll just put it on pause for a moment. All right, so let's move into addition and eventually the opposite, of course, being subtraction. Um, once they're good at regrouping, then we can start to have that conversation. But addition's always easier for students. We know that regardless of whether you're using a tool or not, they will always revert to addition if they're given an option before they would do subtraction. And part of that comes from, again, not understanding what they can borrow from and what, what that borrowing is actually meaning. 
And there would be my argument for introducing dollars and cents, not a decimal, dollars and cents conversation fairly early on. Because if I know that cents make a dollar, that's all I want you to learn. I'm not, I'm not asking you to, to tell me what hundreds are and what tenths are. I'm not using that language. I'm just, what part of the dollar haven't we filled yet? And what have we filled that are dollars? So as we move into the beginning pieces, very typically when you do addition, we often talk about place value. So we say that we have a, a ones column, a tens column, a hundreds column, and we give them a column, a sheet with columns on it that are labeled at the top. And then again, that just becomes a strip that has titles but if I don't understand what they mean and I really don't understand what place value stands for, all I've done is memorize that when you give me a double digit number, that as long as the first digit is in this column, I just look up and it says I have two tens and here I have four ones. I don't really need to know much more. I just memorize that column. And this really hit me when I was doing a, a session with parents. And I said, we're going to work into place value. And a lot of them said, I know what that is. It's the, those sheets with the columns on it. And I said, that's one of the tools that we can use. But that in itself is not place value. And that's where some of our students are. They believe that place value, when you say it, is those columns. And inherently, it's involved in those columns. But it's not, that's not it. So if we, what if we didn't do that? What if we don't give them columns? What if we just say we're going to keep going with money? And so what I do is I, I ask them, I play what's called the show me game, wherever I, whatever school I'm, I'm going to, and we're doing money, I'll say to students, I want you to show me amounts of money that I'm going to call out to you. Now, initially, the very first time I say it, I don't give them any parameters. So if I said, show me $22, and they counted out 22 loonies, have at her, good for you. But I'll bet you anything, you won't have 22 loonies in your pouch. So you're going to run out. So eventually we get to the conversation of efficiency. In other words, use, use the least number of bills and coins that you can to represent the number I'm going to call out. So for example, if I were to say, show me $22, we have them turn them horizontally because it'll leave them more room on their, on their desk. So $22 could be two tens and two loonies. It, and initially, that's what I do. I just walk around. I'm not putting this on the board. I'm not asking them to look up. I'm calling this out because one of your outcomes is also, can the students relate a number that's being called out to them? Well, there's this is a wonder way to get lots of outcomes done at the same time. So I call out $22 and then I'll say, take it back. So they have all their money in your correct order on the side and they'll just take their two, two $10 bills and their two loonies and put them back in their piles from where they belong. Okay. So the next number comes out and I'll say, well, show me $31. So one, two, three, 31. And I'm calling these out. And then I say, all right, can you keep up with me? Let's go really fast. So lots of practice. And this would be a grade six student if they've never done money before. Just practice, 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 calling them out. And then they'll eventually they'll say, well, these are really easy. Like, can't you give us a harder one? I'll say, okay, well, how about if we do this? How about if I say, I gave you $31 and below that, I want you to show me $14. So now I have to have a second number. I don't want it attached. So I have $14 that I'm going to show you. Oops, mine is right there. There we go. And so in my $14, I display that out. And one of the things that I do as I walk around is we say, did you notice that your, your template kind of has a place to put everything? So the $10 bills go under the tens, the $1 bills go under the ones, the hundreds go under. So what are we doing? It's like the columns, but this is real. This is money. This is not just an abstract value. So now my question would be, how much money do you have all together? So then they'll count 10, 20, 30, 40. Usually they pick it up because they want to hold it and count it out again. And then one, two, three, four, five, they'll say I have $45. Excellent. Now you're gonna do a whole 20 minutes of that, calling out numbers, lots of numbers. And for the first 10 of it, there's gonna be no regrouping. And maybe the last one that you call out will be one where they have a one up here, and then you've got a 19 of something that you're gonna add on. And then they're going to put all those together. 
So they'll have 10 of them sitting here and then whatever you called out over here. And when they count them up, they'll still count those up and they'll get the right answer. The hands will go up and they'll say, that's how much money we have. Excellent. That's wonderful. So you tell them that's that's the right answer. That's what I was hoping for. I'm just going to put 10 out so that we can see them. But then my question would be, you know, one of the things I really don't like to do when I'm wearing jeans is I hate wearing walking around with coins in my pocket that I don't need to walk around with. If I don't have to walk around with a ton of extra stuff, I don't. So my question is, could there have been something you could have done that would have made that easier? Now, some of your students will already have done that. They'll already recognize that they could have taken these right off the map and traded them for this. And others will go, oh, yeah, I could take those 10 and then I could trade them for another 10 and then you have none left. Perfect. So now you've gone into the regrouping, right? I regrouped by trading 10 loonies for another $10 bill. So then the rule becomes from now on, whenever you can trade, regroup, you're going to do that. You're going to make those trades so that you have the least number of coins possible. And that really gets to the heart of when we're talking about addition of single, double digit to a single digit, two single digits. This is what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get students to recognize that. So now I can say to them, show me $26, so 26, and you could be doing this as I'm calling them out. That gives you an idea of how long it takes. And they're pretty quick. Like once they get the hang of this, because they think it's, they got all this money in their hands and they just think it's great. And then below that, I want you to show me $15. So then we show them $15. And we'll say, all right, so now I can walk around. I can see that I see my $26. I see my $15. Very good. Now, how much money do you have all together? So then they're pretty quick to go, oh, one, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those guys are gone. I'm going to trade it for another one of these. And I end up with, and it's the hands up in the air, done. Like that's the enthusiasm that you will hear. So the more we can do with that, and then I can start to move them forward, even in grade two, I will say to them, how many of these $10 bills would you need to make $100? Because boy, when they want to get a $100 bill in their hand, that's that's the place to go. So that gives them an opportunity then to think that through. And that's that's not beyond them to do that, for sure not. And definitely not for grade three, because they're adding three digit numbers. So in grade three, I might say, can you show me, let's do a, a grade three question. So in a grade three question, I might say, show me $113. And below that, can you show me $28? So $28. Oh, there you go. And then the same thing. How much money do you have all together? So the fact that they can play with a $100 bill is pretty exciting. And you do have to remind them this is not real money. They, that for a lot of students, they've never seen a $100 bill, leave alone a $1,000 bill. So of course they want harder numbers. And it, as you gauge where your students are at, you keep practicing. And in grade threes, um, I often, they'll say, give us a really hard one. And so I do, I give them 100, $99. Remember, it's not 199 because that would be a decimal. So $199. And to that, add $99. They just, that, that's a great one because now they've really got to think about their regrouping. And then eventually, I can start to introduce paper and pencil beside it. So I'm just doing this. And you're not doing this for a day. You're doing this for a long time. The faster they can picture this and do this in their head and with their hands, the better it becomes with your paper and pencil. So eventually you can introduce the paper and pencil. At the grade three level, I will also say to them, you know, we're going to step this up one, one, one more. I'm going to say, show me $113.20. So 
So now they're pretty excited that they get to do something in the scent side. So they can show me two dimes. And I'm not going to do anything with those dimes initially. I'm just going to start small. I just want to know, can they get the cents in there? I'm not doing decimals, just dollars and cents. And to that, I want you to add um, $12. Okay, so I'm not going to ask them to regroup. Then I'll ask them for, for trading, grouping, converting, that type of thing. But I won't touch the dimes. But eventually, then I will. They're going to say, they'll say to you, what about these dimes? And you can do something with them. Oh, you want something on those too. So then the next question might be where I ask them for three dimes. And then I have seven dimes. So do they know to trade that for a loony? And then just working my way up. And then eventually I order in pennies. There is no rush to get there, but it's always just dollars and cents. Show me $124.32. $154.21. Remember the and is the, the line. They don't know it's a decimal yet. If grade threes are doing that, although we're not testing them on decimals, their understanding of dollars and cents parts of the whole becomes so good that by the time they get to grade four and they're introduced to the decimal to understand that this is actually a decimal value here, that makes it very simple transition for them. So just keeping that in the back of your mind as you start working through those number systems with the students, do as much of this as you possibly can. Okay, so now let me ask another question of the students because we're not just going to do adding. I'm going to do adding, tons of adding, and it's always going to do adding. But let's say my answer that I got was $134. Okay, that was my answer to a question that I gave them. So now I might say to them, can you tell me how many ones you, or sorry, can you tell me um, what is in the ones position? How many are in the ones position? The so $134. So I had four loonies in the $1 position. How many tens are in our number? So when they look at that and say three tens are in our number, then I might say, well, I think that there is a three in the tens position. But my question to you was how many tens are in this number? That's a different question. And that's where that place value columns of just titling them. Often we lose the students. They don't really understand what they're doing because they don't understand that I can have a position so what value is the tens position here? Three. I have three tens in the tens position. How many tens in the number? 134. Well, there's 10 tens in here. And I have three more. So there's actually 13 tens in this number. That's an important distinction for students to make. And so we need to make that distinction for them as well. So we always want to ask them questions like that. So once they've done an addition, you might say, what number is in the ones position? What's the value of the tens in the tens position? How many ones are in this number? There are four ones in the ones position. How many ones in this number? 134. So I throw that at you right now to think about to start integrating that as part of the practice of addition and subtraction, because they need to understand the difference between the position of the number. So one, three, four, I have 134. I have three tens in that number, the way it's written. There's a three in the tens position versus the total number of tens in the number. And the bigger the number, the more questions you can ask. Because if my number was 1,134, I could say how many hundreds are in that number? How many tens in that number? More tens than there were before, because now I have a thousand dollar bill. So they really start to understand that product of 10 and the division by 10. All right, so now let's just do a quick 
um, subtraction one, and then we'll wind this part of the of the session up. So let's say I asked you to show me twenty-two dollars there, and from there I ask you to take away. So now we say to them, we're going to switch from addition to subtractions. So we want to take some money away from this. So I'd like you to take away twelve dollars. You're going to start small and start simple. Give them success. So take away twelve dollars. Oh, that's easy. I have ten dollars left over. Great. So do a whole bunch of examples like that. So I'll go back to my $22. And let's say to them, I'd like you to take away $3. And they'll say, I don't have $3. But is there something you can do that would get you $3? They're very quick to, to recognize that I can take this and trade it for 10 loonies. So now I'm going to put my 10 loonies here and have 12 of them so I can take away my three and have $19 left over. That's the power of money. That I can see. I can see that I still get $10 whether I put 10 loonies down or a $10 bill. More than I can with a rod and just squares. So giving me lots of practice at that is a way to go as well. And if it's a grade three student, I would ask them some questions when they are really good, not don't push it. I would even ask them some questions with dollars and cents where they have to maybe regroup a dime or regroup some pennies. Don't make pennies and dimes at the same time, like be reasonable. Okay, so we will see you in the next unit. We're gonna look a little bit more at some math facts and a little bit more with these numbers as well.